So I'm going to talk about how antibody validation enables effective target validation at GSK. And I work in a, a large group called Target Sciences. So I'm going to start off by telling you a bit about Target Sciences and how that kind of impacts how we need to do an antibody validation. Okay, so I expect many of you have seen a graph like this before, which shows the declining returns that are being realized by pharma companies. So for each dollar invested, we're getting lower and lower returns on that, that investment. So within GSK, prior to the uh, formation of Target Sciences, we had this kind of drug discovery chevron, which you will probably all have seen before. And target validation was a very short-lived affair before people leapt straight into designing drugs and going into screening campaigns. Um, but sort of GSK decided that we need to do something about this declining return. And one way that we've done that is to invest in a, a group called Target Sciences, which works very early on in the drug discovery uh, chevron and is focused very much on identifying new targets and validating those targets uh, more comprehensively before we embark on uh, chemistry campaigns. So how are we formed? We have got uh, a lot of emphasis on genomics, so we have genetics group, statistical genetics, we have a lot of bioinformatics people who are looking at all the various databases that are out there publicly, and we have wet lab team which involves um, things like functional genomics, CRISPR knockouts, cell biologists and um, histologists. And we're very big into sharing data, and we like to do things pre-competitively as much as we can um, before, before we start designing our drugs. Um, we've just had a major reorganization at GSK, um, and the emphasis on these kind of genetic resources are becoming even more strong than it was before. So we have a lot of collaborations like UK Biobank, 23andMe, which has been a huge investment, and these are producing thousands of potential targets which are genetically associated with diseases. And we have our in silico groups which are then triaging these lists of targets down to hundreds of targets which then enter into our experimental studies. So we've sort of gradually got this funnel which is rapidly reducing the number of targets down to 10 to 100. And eventually we want to, for each project, say take 1,000 targets down to one or two which will go into drug discovery. We have support from um, platform groups for high throughput screening, uh, genome-wide CRISPR screens, and we also have very close interactions with therapy areas, um, and they provide us with their expertise on specific indications. So going back again now to the early stage of the pipeline, we can see that we have a huge number of targets coming out from in silico hypothesis generation experiments, and we have this emphasis in the experimental labs, which is to rapidly triage these targets down using experimental data, and actually proving that these gene disease linkages could actually be a therapeutic target. Okay? And this process needs to be fast and robust. We don't want to be holding up the process of drug development too much if we can help it. We also need to be able to match the scale of the in silico output. You know, you can come up with huge lists of targets using computers. Um, it's difficult to match that in the lab. So this is the first time I'm mentioning antibodies. We use a lot of key technologies here to identify which targets are efficacious, which targets are safe. And we do that using things like functional genomics, uh, cell-based assays, target localization in tissue. And after we do this initial triage, with the best candidates, we then move on to doing evaluation of the target in translational models. Okay, so how do we use antibodies? Well, we use them in just about every way you could possibly use them. We've got lots of very fancy equipment imaging flow cytometry, um, where you can look at the morphology of cells and the markers at the same time. We use Western blotting to validate knockouts, which we've done in um, primary cells, primary patient cells. We're looking at functional changes in, in cell lines and uh, primary cells in an assay under the influence of compounds. Um, we started using this technology called Trim Away, where you can actually um, electroporate antibodies into a cell and the protein uh, that the antibody binds to is very rapidly degraded within, seven, within an hour to like 10% um, of its original amount, which helps if you've got pro, uh, proteins like housekeepers, which you can't really knock out with knockout, uh, CRISPR knockout. We do a lot of IHC, which is going to be the topic of this talk, and obviously flow cytometry. So 
we're going to now move on to talking about histology, and there's some very specific demands for histological target validation at scale. Okay? So for a good quality target expression study, uh, we need very high quality disease and normal tissue for the intended assay. We need control materials in order to validate the, op the uh, probe reagents which we're going to be using for the assays. They need to optimize the IHC and institute hybridization protocol, do some image analysis and validate our assay end-to-end -end for robustness. So the rest of the talk is going to be focused on these two areas because it's obviously of most relevance here. So this was the, uh, before Target Sciences was formed, our group used to support kind of late stage projects in vivo models. And the great thing there was the tissue was being supplied to us, you know, uh, from in vivo models. We were just receiving the tissue. Cellular reagents were generally available because this was a late stage project. A lot of money has been invested in it. We've got huge project teams working on it. Antibody validation's probably already been done, just using markers, um, like one or two markers, and we, the assay's already optimised. So we can whiz through these experiments in a very short order, a few months. Um, so, yeah, so just to emphasise, a lot of these things are pre-existing, or we've only got one target to validate. But the problem we've got in our department now is that the genetic targets can be in any tissue. You know, they're not, they don't say... No, we are only going to be in lung tissue or cancer tissue. It could be any disease. We don't have cellular reagents. Nobody's you know, bothered to take the time or money to, to generate them previously. We don't have antibodies. No optimised assay. It's not an established drug target. And we've also got 100 targets to work on. And we've been asked if we can do it in three months as well. <laughs> so these things here at the start don't change much. We've got the same project scope and contracts to to make, and we've got tissue acquisition to do. But now we've got to do cellular reagent generation, antibody validation, assay optimization at a huge scale and in the same time frame. Mm -hmm. So obviously the only way we can do this is to really see if we can get an efficient pipeline, industrialise this process, and really sort of, at the moment we're sort of brute forcing it. So um, when you sort of Listen to my talk, you can come up with any ideas of how we can make that even more efficient. <laughs> I'd be happy to hear them. Okay, so moving on to the antibody validation pipeline. Um, we obviously have to make compromises about the cost of doing things, the time it takes, um, <coughs> you know, the extent of things. So the first thing we do is to ensure that we're selecting the best possible reagents we can. This is what we call the antibody selection phase. And then depending on the confidence in the existing validation data, we will go on to do all of these different things. And you've heard a lot of these things before. So we're looking at specificity. We're looking at the suitability for the reagent in the assay using orthogonal methods. And we're trying to look at um, whether the antibody is cross-reacting to other genes. We're very keen to publish the data because only a very small percentage of the targets we're looking at will actually go into a drug discovery campaign. The other 95%, we can easily publish that. And we're very keen to share our data to public data sets. So if any of you um, would be interested in talking, talking to me and trying to get hold of our data, we'd be happy to share that. So for antibody selection, we begin searching for antibodies with suppliers that have a declared antibody validation strategy. And you know, from our communications with them, we, we know that they care about the antibody validation. And you know, we look at these kind of factors to understand which, which vendors to work with. Um, we do do searching for, for keywords like knockout. At the moment, most websites don't seem to have validation criteria as searchable filters on the website, so you have to do a lot of investigative work to actually dig them out. We look at things like the Human Protein Atlas, which are public databases, and we use data aggregation tools like BenchSci, which is like a machine learning tool which pulls out validation <coughs> evidence from the literature and CITAB, and actually Antibodypedia, which I haven't forgot to list here. And I was just saying here that what we'd really like from these data aggregators is more focus on ranking by validation data, not on citation numbers, because this is a bit biased against more recently uh, generated antibodies, which may actually have higher quality. Uh, then we work with high trusted antibody vendors to understand whether they have reagents in the pipeline. And obviously, if a gene has zero well-validated antibodies, we really have to down-prioritise it, because we haven't got the resources to go and generate a new antibody for a lot of these targets, we just don't have the time. 
And I was interested to see the diagram earlier on about the number of antibodies for targets. This is kind of looking at the opposite direction. Some guys from Target Sciences looked at the number of publications and how many, uh, you know, for each gene, how many publications were there. And they found that 80% of publications linking gene to disease are from 5% of genes. So I'll be very interested to see if we can like match those two data sets up and see if this, the number of papers is predictive of the number of reagents that you can get hold of and the quality. So for a while we were thinking about trying to get these uh, genetically engineered cell reagents generated um, bespoke. We then managed to find some commercially available um, suppliers who actually have 80% of the, pr the proteome available as overexpressing cells. So we can rapidly get these cells off the shelf, tagged with a, um, a tag. We can get them to have uh, special treatment conditions for, for things like secreted proteins to keep the protein in the cell. And there's also many more knockout reagents all the time off the shelf. So we don't necessarily have to go and find the resources to make them ourselves anymore, which has been a great boon, really. Um, if there's no overexpression cells available, we just uh, get these suppliers to add them to their portfolio. And then we get them to actually pellet the cells and process them as required for our end assay. So I think a lot of these... Um, <coughs> were originally generated as lysates and sold as lysates. We're now asking these suppliers to produce FFPE, so pellet the cells down, process them for FFPE into blocks, and we can use those as controls for our assays. And obviously, these reagents themselves need to be QC'd and, and proven to be, to be uh, reliable before we can use them for validation of antibodies. And so the idea is that if we have a long list of targets, we can go to various vendors until we've got a complete list of complete coverage of that target list with cell reagents. <coughs> One issue we have, though, is that a lot of these clones uh, of expression cells have variable expression levels, so they're not necessarily all producing um, sufficient protein to be detected necessarily. Okay, so once we've got the, the uh, cell lines, we're now going to be using them on the assay of interest. So these are FFP. Uh, cell lines which have pelleted into, into blocks. And this is a tissue microarray with healthy and diseased tissue of interest. So we're running the test antibody across that panel of tissue and reagents. We're also running anti-tag antibodies. So in these cells, we can actually co-localize the signal from the tag with the signal from the test antibody. And we're using RNA scope to understand what the localization of the protein and RNA is. So what this, these three things here are able to us to understand is the sensitivity and specificity of the assay. Does the data actually correlate with published anti antibody data on tissue and the subcellular localization and allows us to compare RNA and protein levels and localization? So if at least one antibody performs well, we, discuss, we just, just, just discard all the other antibodies. And if there's no ideal results, then we either investigate further or get a custom antibody generated, or just down-prioritise that target. We've got so many targets that we uh, don't necessarily have to have success in all of them to move forwards. We're also using orthogonal methods. So these are, at the moment, we find they're helpful in increasing confidence. Uh, we're still trying to build up data as to whether they're actually predictive of performance in IHC. And this is, uh, so we're using protein arrays um, from CDI, Cambridge Protein Arrays. And we have in this assay seen quite a, a varied performance of antibodies. So we've seen some which are beautifully monospecific and we've seen some which just cross-react to everything. And we're also using Western blot. Uh, IP mass spec, something we'd like to look at, but it's still a gap. We don't really think this is um, quite so critical for the work we're trying to do. Um, preferably something we'd like to outsource if we can. So, um, high throughput histology. We've spent a lot of time building up the pipelines, building up the capabilities we need, building contracts with suppliers. Now, we actually have our first project in flight at the moment. So we've got, at the moment, 50 targets coming from an in silico pipeline. We're taking the off-the-shelf or outsourced cell line generation until we have a negative, a low, and or high um, overexpressing cell line. 
We have TMA constructed like a basic TMA with a small number of cores for each of the organs of interest. And then we're taking up to three antibodies which has been specified for IHC uh, in paraffin per target. So this means we're already looking at 150 antibodies in just this one project. Running that on these slides and then we have tests that we actually be able to understand if the antibody works in that tissue format. I take the, the top antibodies and run them on protein array and western to get that orthogonal information. Run the RNA scope assay and then robustness testing for the top antibody. And then what we have is some tissue microarrays which have much higher numbers of tissue samples. So we're looking at at least 30 per treatment group uh, where you know, treatment is disease versus healthy or various severities of disease. And then we can do that in triplicate for the IHC, in triplicate for RNA scope. And um, you know, if we have time on the project, we're hoping to do multiplexing so we can really assign those targets to specific cell types. And again here, we're looking to do that in three months. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now, just a few thoughts here. So I've, I've told you that GSK Target Science is using like latest technologies and the best talent to revolutionize the selection and validation of targets for new and better medicines. <coughs> using experimental data triage to link gene to disease, and especially to a therapeutic drug target that's actually a viable drug target. We really need confidence in the data we're generating because these are sort of huge investment decisions that are being made. The drug discovery campaign is a hundred million pound exercise. Uh, and antibody validation is really a critical piece of the puzzle. Without valid antibodies, we're just making the wrong decisions. But we do need it to be fast and scalable. So we need to be able to do very large numbers. Um, one key benefit that we've had recently is the availability of these control reagents off the shelf and also the ambition of our leadership and things to actually do things at scale. And it's really enabling us to do things that are previously impossible throughput. Um, but we still need to do more, and the community still needs to do more. So I've just listed some resources that we really love to have access to. So from the antibody vendors, we would love <laughs> to have them pre validated for specificity and selectivity, so cross-reactivity here. We'd love it if antibodies could be retired if they don't pass the comprehensive QC. Um, we want search filters based on the validation data, not just the species that they've been raised in or the, the, the assay format. Um, and all, clearly, the antibody va vendors are building these antibody validation platforms. It would be great if we could send and honestly send in antibodies which could be validated on those platforms for a fee. Because ideally, we don't want to be validating antibodies. That's not our role in life. We want to be developing drugs. For the search engines, we really want to, the validation data to be made easy to access, searchable using filters, um, and also provide bulk search tools, because at the moment we have to do every single target one at a time. Um, we want search tools that can identify and rank by validation status, not by citation number. <clears throat> um, from validation reagent vendors, it would be ideal if we could get the... Uh, Protein arrays, for example, with controlled protein expression levels for 100% coverage of protein targets. Or, well, genes, genes anyway. So I think 80% at the moment, so it's not far to go. Um, just a bit frustrating then, but that top, the last 20%. Um, getting cell reagents off the shelf. You know, we don't really want to be having to spend months and months contracting with people to set up agreements. If they can be sold off the shelf for a fixed fee, that really makes everybody's life a lot easier. Uh, yeah, having overexpressing knockout and wild type for the same genes, having the, these cell reagents pre-validated for a range of expression levels, not just on or off, um, and also having them available in multiple formats, so FFP, blocks, lysates, live cells. <laughs> and I just want to finish off by making some observations on the antibody validation conference and the community. You know, when I came to the conference last time, I came back with a wealth of new ideas, new material ideas and contacts. And it's been very helpful helping us to spread the word in GSK to people who are not so involved in antibody validation. They don't really understand necessarily the importance of it. And also I've given several presentations in GSK to spread the word there. I feel it's clearly having an impact on vendors. 
So highly validated product lines are becoming available all the time. And most conversations I have with reps are now around antibody validation, the quality of the product. Um, so I think it's encouragement to all the scientists uh, and all the vendors alike to keep up the focus on delivering the quality science. And I think that very soon we'll actually have solved this problem if we all work together. Okay, so just acknowledging all the people in the GSK team who delivered data or thoughts for the presentation, organising committee, and all of our future vendors and collaborators. Thank you. Yeah so, we, yeah, so we don't just use one condition. We use like four or five different antigen retrieval methods. And then once we've got an antigen retrieval method, which we think represent, it represents the best possible choice, then we move on and do a full concentration curve as well. Can you roll back to your pipeline slide? So you begin with, with a tissue microarray, right? And then from there, you go to Western blotting and protein arrays, and you select the top two, and you take those two further. Uh, now you are moving afterwards between applications, and you are beginning with the greenest temperature, and then you go from there to Western blotting and protein arrays, and you're selecting the top two. What is the rationale for doing that? And how, what's your experience? So the, the difficulty with IHC is you have a lot, obviously there's a huge matrix of proteins there. So you can run your antibody across those tissues and the signal could be coming from anything. So using these positive control cell lines, we have the target of interest in those cells. So we've demonstrated that the antibody specifically binds to the target. What we haven't demonstrated is that it does not bind to anything else. Then we put the, obviously you're looking at the tissue microarray, thousands and thousands of proteins being expressed there. The signal that you detect could be due to binding to something else. So we have to have a way of understanding whether that antibody is cross-reacting to other things. At the moment, the protein array is the best method we think to actually cover the proteome at the moment. And we're trying to build up, build up our experience there. So that's why I say we, we feel it builds confidence we haven't actually got a huge data set to actually tell us how reliable that is. This is an important point, because what you're saying is that you cannot assess specificity in immunist establishment. You have to use Western blocking or a protein array. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. That's how I interpret you. I'm saying for full confidence you can't just rely on an IHC result. So how often do you find that in the protein array your intended target is the top rank. And how many, how many times do you find that you have a single? I work with protein or S2, and I rarely find one single protein binding. I find that usually there's, there's a continuum of proteins. And the intended target, at least in my areas, I mean, I don't work with CDI, but I would assume that it would be the same. So it, it, quite often we find that there's a continuum uh, of, of binders in the array, and that's Well, we find that the majority of cases, like you say, that the, the antibodies that we are selecting, which are uh, what we think are the best candidates in the first place, do tend to perform very well. And they come up in the top 10 of the hits top 10, right? yeah. the majority of times. Um, we have examples which are, have like tenfold 
binding to the top tar the intended target, and all the others are just not detected at all. We have some where the target's number is like three or four, which are bound. Um, so. so I think once we have, once we've tested 150 antibodies, and that's going to be a huge data resource to look at. So unfortunately, we just haven't got the depth of information yet to be able to to make any generalised statements. We just have we have isolated examples at the moment, and we want to build up our data sets first. The throughput is the number of targets which we are trying to investigate. So we are actually selecting the best three antibodies from the available catalogue from all vendors okay. to take forwards. Okay. Yeah. What more do animal models play in your, your sort of process now? So we, we are very interested in, in using human material wherever possible human primary cells, human tissues. Um, animal models are generally reserved for looking at the, sort of the, the effects of functional modification. of. Well, so if we put to putting compounds into animal models and looking at the actual impact of, of treatment of the target, so that would actually be, once we've selected a target, that would be all the resources we poured into things like in vivo <laughs> models, although we are trying to build up more complex in vitro models wherever we can to replace animal models because we feel they're more... Translational. One more quick, one quick question. Very quick. Um, out of the, all the antibodies you selected from commercial source, mm. how often do you see them? Even though it's a different kind of number, but it turns out to be the same antibody. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so things like um, so the, the data, the, the antibody aggregators, things like Bench Science Cytab. So Benchside, for example, pulls out figures from papers and figures from antibody vendor websites. And you can quite often see that there's like 25 products and they've all got the same image. Uh, but it depends, it varies between the target, I guess, the popularity of the target. Yeah. 